All right. Well, thank you all for joining us for the No War Machine webinar in support of the Divest from the War Machine campaign. We are super excited and grateful to be connected to all of you. Uh, my name is Haley. I am a campaign coordinator with Code Pink. And just to very quickly go over some logistics for the webinar, we are going to open up space to take some questions uh, later on in the webinar. And so you can send us those questions throughout the session using the chat box that you'll see on the bottom of your screen. And anyone joining by phone and uh, not via their computer can email me questions throughout the webinar to Haley at codepink.org. So that's spelled H-A-L-E-Y at codepink.org. So again, very excited uh, to be connected to all of you and looking forward to giving you a lot of information on the campaign and also some next steps and how to get these campaigns going in your communities. So now I'll pass it on to Christy. Hey everyone, this is Christy. Um, I am a campaign consultant with Code Pink. Um, my background is in the environmental and climate justice movements um, in corporate campaigning and direct action. So I am super excited to be here with you today um, and, and to be connected with this movement. Um, so I feel really honored um, to be a part of this. Um, for those of you who are brand new to Code Pink, um, I'm not sure there are that many of you, but if you're brand new to Code Pink, don't know what Code Pink is, um, Code Pink is a women-led grassroots organization that is working to end U.S. wars and militarism, um, support peace and human rights, um, and redirect um, not only our tax dollars, but all of our dollars um, away from what we not so lovingly call the war machine and into life affirming programs like healthcare, education, green jobs. Um, and so that's really that last bit is really the crux of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, but again, Code Pink is this really amazing organization that was founded in the fall of 2002 um, as a grassroots effort to oppose um, the war in Iraq in the lead up to that war, um, continuing to organize for justice for Iraqis, holding war criminals accountable, opposing continued wars um, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, um, against torture for the closure of Guantanamo. There are just so many amazing programs um, that Code Pink has, has worked towards over the years and and really Code Pink is, is rooted in this network of local organizers and local organizations um, connected with online supporters um, and, and really emphasizing um, the beauty of direct action, including satire, street theater, creative visuals, civil disobedience, um, and, and is really known for its bold direct action challenging power holders. Um, and of course, wearing pink. Um, and, and again, this is really, um, this spirit is really what we're hoping to infuse our latest campaign, um, this divestment campaign with. Um, not just wearing pink, but this, um, this commitment to holding power holders accountable, this commitment to bold direct action, creative visuals, and again, really rooted in local campaigns, supporting local organizers and local organizations. Um, so um, that's a little bit about Code Pink. I've kind of teased a little bit now what this divestment campaign is going to be all about. Um, so at this point, I will hand it back to Haley. All right. So today we're going to start by providing a bit of background on the campaign in general. Also in October, we hosted a Divest from the War Machine Summit in Washington, DC to mark the launch of the campaign. So we're going to recap that event for those of you who weren't able to attend or who maybe who haven't uh, seen the videos online yet. 
We are also going to introduce you to a series of organizing resources that we're launching today. And then Christy will be providing a training on choosing a focal point for your own campaign. Then after we'll open up space for questions and talk about the next steps. So Code Pink and really the anti-war movement more generally have long worked to get our nation to stop buying war. So push this message of don't buy war and to really try to get the profit motive out of war. But we've always directed these efforts to Congress and the White House. And as we are seeing almost on a daily basis, Congress and the White House are indifferent to the needs of the people and the planet. And Democrats and Republicans alike keep channeling more and more money into war and militarism and really embracing a policy of militarized belligerence. So we're taking on this campaign to really take a stand and oppose the war economy. So this political economic system dependent on continued warfare. And at the roots of that war economy, are the weapons companies that, as we say, are making a killing on killing. So for instance, in 2016, $741.3 billion went into the war machine and $304 billion went directly to corporations. So almost half of that number. Also, uh, the same amount that went directly to corporations fueling the war machine could put every unemployed person to work in the United States in infrastructure. So we're really coming at this campaign knowing that there is a desperate need to move away from a war economy that is extractive and oppressive and violent and to really move toward a peace economy that's based on sharing, caring, community, and also resilience. So while this is a campaign about the movement of money, the ultimate goal of this campaign is for it to be a tool to really build an anti-war movement that is powerful enough to get this Teflon Congress to end wars and stop fueling the global arms trade. So knowing that effective activism happens locally and it happens relationally, we asked how do we bring the cost of war home? How do we really bring the reality of war home and into our communities? So there are so many stories to tell and so many truths to expose. And when we do, they tend to create a sense of overwhelm and sort of make people feel futile in the face of the war machine. So this campaign is about creating a pathway to action that lets us channel our action and channel our despair really into direct action. So we're working on creating the tools to begin to build power and to bring, these, bring our communities into this fight. And at its core, uh, Divest from the War Machine is a divestment campaign. So divestment means removing invested assets or pulling stocks from a particular set of companies or from an industry. And this campaign is urging individual investors and financial institutions to divest from weapons companies and their top funders. And divestment is a tool that anyone can use. You don't have to be a, a millionaire or billionaire with a massive investment portfolio or the fund manager of a massive university endowment. We all really do have power here and all of our interests are represented by different financial institutions. And we'll dive into that later. And really at its base, uh, it just doesn't make sense to hold stock in weapons companies while understanding the global and domestic consequences of endless wars and the spread of militarism. So if we help to lead this national divestment campaign focused on the stigmatization of these war profiteers and weakening their political capital, we can really build the momentum of a peace economy. We can reignite the anti-war movement as a powerful force in the United States and reclaim our institutions from the war machine. And as of now, we are focusing on what we call the big five. So these are the top five US-based arms producers. And these are Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, and General Dynamics. These are the top five weapons manufacturing companies, both in terms of their, uh, their dominance of the global arms trade, as well as in that they are the top recipients of contracts from the Pentagon. And each of these five companies has annual sales of tens of billions of dollars. All of their CEOs earned a combined total of about $100 million in 2016. So looking at this year, 2016, Lockheed Martin's CEO made $20 million and the CEOs of Raytheon and Boeing made around $14 million. 
And in that same year, approximately 157,000 people died in violent conflicts around the world. The number of displaced people globally, uh, many displaced by wars and the war economy, rose to 65 million people. And research now shows that 90% of deaths resulting from global violent conflicts are civilians and mostly women and children. So that these two realities exist, one of endless profits for military corporations and one of endless suffering for the victims of the war machine is horrendous. But we are using divestment as a strategy because it really enables us to channel our anger and channel our grief and our sense of overwhelm into direct action in our local communities. So we're building campaigns in city halls, in mayor's offices, on university campuses, in partnerships with major foundations, and more. And this campaign is truly needed at this moment because military corporations are thriving and the US war machine really shows, shows uh, no sign of subsiding anytime soon. So as we remain engaged in seven active conflicts and as we inch closer to war with North Korea and Iran, military and aerospace companies are seeing their stocks soar and have seen their stocks rise 40% overall since Trump took office a year ago. So many of our churches and universities and cities and so on are supporting this and often unaware that they're supporting the war machine. And this campaign really gives us and our communities power to take a stand, uh, to expose these truths and also to cut our cultural ties to war by way of cutting our financial ties to war. Uh, so we can't wait to work with you to stop ourselves and our nation's institutions from again, making a killing on killing and to tell us a little bit more about how we're going to do that, I'm going to pass it on over to Christy. Great. So as Haley mentioned, um, this campaign is not about asking Congress or the president um, or national power holders to act. Um, this campaign is really about our, us reclaiming and building people power in our communities in order to divest these funds away from war and away from killing and towards these life-affirming programs in our communities. So with this campaign, what this looks like is um, you all, um, as Code Pinkers, as folks scattered around the country and potentially um, even internationally. Um, this looks like you all starting campaigns um, in your communities in the way that makes the most sense for you. Um, so we've identified a handful of ways that this can happen. Um, one of the ways um, is by getting cities and mayors to take pledges to divest city funds away from war machine profiteers, um, weapons manufacturers and the like. Um, so this happens on the city level. This could happen on the pension level with unions and with city employees. Um, this happens with students at universities getting schools and universities to divest from the war machine um, within religious institutions. We know that um, churches and other religious institutions are often, um, perhaps most ironically, um, still invested in so many of these companies that are making a killing from killing. So these are just a handful of examples of places where the war machine kind of touches down um, in our daily lives. And so through divestment, we are, again, no longer going to power holders and asking for permission or asking them to act. Rather, we are reclaiming our power as citizens and as participants in these various institutions that I've mentioned and, and getting our institutions to divest. And through this kind of collective action, we could actually leverage a lot more money away from these companies um, than a single bill might be able to. Um, and certainly with the Congress we have and with the president we have, um, asking those institutions for 
for help is, is no longer really a viable option as we see it. And our option really is to rely on ourselves and to build this people power um, to divest from the war machine. So again, this looks like you all starting campaigns on the local level in the way that makes the most sense for you all. Um, local groups picking targets um, and taking action. Um, Code Pink as an organization is taking on one of the big five. Um, as Haley mentioned, there are these five biggest companies. Code Pink has selected um, Lockheed Martin as its organizational target. Um, but again, there may be a different company in your local community, or it may make the most sense for you to take on your city or your school or a socially responsible investment company that you have ties with um, and really work on those levels. So div divestment campaigns are really this incredible buffet of options um, where you can really pick and choose um, what ingredients make the most sense for you and your group. Um, and we as Code Pink are taking on, again, taking on Lockheed Martin for um, its role as one of the biggest companies making a killing on killing. Um, and it's the company that makes the most sense organizationally for us to take on. Um, but there are a lot of other options um, and a lot of other ways to plug in. And really with this campaign, one of our biggest goals is to do as much coaching to offer as many resources and to provide as much support to you and your local campaigns as we can. Um, so as Haley mentioned, I'm going to be doing a little bit of a training later on um, in this training um, on target selection and how to pick a target that makes the most sense for you all. Um, and we're gonna be doing more trainings in the new year. There's gonna be another webinar in January where I'll be doing a training on how to create a creative action um, in your community on, on this divestment campaign. Um, and we also have a whole bunch of resources that Haley and I are gonna be talking about later um, that are gonna be available to download online so that you can take those back to your group. Um, and, and use those as tools to really get your campaign started. Um, and I actually see a question here in the chat um, about whether this webinar will be available to view online later to share with other, um, other folks. And the answer is yes. So these webinars um, will be recorded um, so that you can share them later with your groups. Um, even if you just wanted to watch like a short portion of the webinar, that will also be available. But um, really one of the goals that we've set out for ourselves is to create as much support for your local campaigns as we can. Um, so if there are resources that your group um, could use, if there is coaching or support that your group needs, um, please let, I think it's best for you to email Haley at this point, but let us know how we can support you and what resources would be useful. Um, because divestment is an incredible strategy, but it's a really big strategy, which means that it really takes all of us um, in order to make a dent in these companies. Um, so as best we can support you, that's what we're here for. Um, and also to kind of get you excited, in addition to this webinar that we'll be hosting in, um, in January on creative action, we're also going to be um, doing a week of action. Um, at the end of January, or early February, um, we're gonna be hosting a week of action where groups can start taking action against these targets in their communities and um, start calling out some of these companies that are um, profiting from killing. Um, so we'll be talking a little bit more about how to plug in with that week of action later on, but I definitely want to make a plug now um, to invite you to think about what that might look like for your group. Um, and as you, uh, as we go through the target selection training later on to be kind of viewing that through the lens of what could this action, um, whether it's a day of action in your community or 
um, in some way participating in this week of action, what that might look like um, for you and your group. Um, so get excited because it's going to be big and super fun and awesome. Um, and Haley, I think you're up. All right. Great. So we have an absolutely amazing coalition that's taking on this campaign with us. It's currently comprised of, I think the number actually just rose to 68 supporting organizations all around the country. And these include think tanks like the Institute for Policy Studies, also legal organizations like the Center for Constitutional Rights. We also have many other anti-war groups involved like the Black Alliance for Peace, Peace Action, and Beyond Nuclear. We are also working closely with other weapons divestment efforts. So namely, Don't Bank on the Bomb, which is a project of PACS in the Netherlands, also in support of ICANN, which is the organization winning the Nobel Peace Prize this weekend. And uh, Don't Bank on the Bomb is an international campaign focused on divestment from nuclear weapons producers and their funders. And the top five also all produce nuclear, so they're on the same list. And their work has been really important to our own and we're plugging in on some city level work with them. So we're also partnered with some student groups like American University NAACP and Cal Poly Students for Quality Education who will be using this campaign to take on their university's endowment funds and also in a more general way, educating students about the influence of military contractors on their campuses. And we are also connected to many faith organizations, including Christian Peacemaker Teams and Dorothy Day Catholic Worker. We also have some coalition partners who are going to help us develop strategies very unique to our own campaign. So for instance, we have war tax resistors that are going to uh, help us develop a plan to divest our taxes from the war machine. Also, we are partnered with the National Network Opposing the Militarization of Our Youth and they oppose recruitment in high schools. And so we're going to work with them to develop ways to divest the bodies of our youth from the war machine. So it's a super strong, uh, powerful coalition behind this campaign. And it's really only going to get stronger and more powerful as we really get these local campaigns going. And so now I'm going to go over the Divest from the War Machine Summit, which we held October 21st and 22nd in Washington, DC. So we brought together historians, voices from the government and military, as well as experienced divestment advocates to really frame the war machine that we're dealing with and to examine the power of divestment to make lasting change and take on powerful, well-established industries or global issues. So we heard from a number of foreign policy experts. For instance, William Hartung, he is from the Center for International Policy. And he spoke to us about how this campaign needs to expose weapons companies as the merchants of death that they truly are. And he gave the example of Lockheed Martin. And in all of their press releases, they call themselves a high technology company. But in reality, they receive 92% of their revenue from war and military services. And so don't want the public knowing or thinking about the fact that the high technology that they are producing is uh, missiles and fighter jets and tanks and other tools of warfare. We also heard from Ajamu Baraka, the founder of Black Alliance for Peace, and Vijay Prashad, a prominent historian and journalist, and both really told us that this campaign uh, must cut both our financial and cultural ties to war and that the politics and the history of the war machine as a tool to expand U.S. corporate interests and really assert U.S. global hegemony needs to be at the, for the forefront of this campaign. We also heard from Larry Wilkerson, who you see pictured here on the screen. He was the chief of staff under Colin Powell and he's now a really a leading voice in the anti-war movement and calling for a reeling in of this unrestrained war machine. And he said at the summit, how did we get here? How did we get to this point where you have a man who has fought in three wars, who's been in the military, served nine presidents, seven of them in uniform, and I'm telling you, the country is in grave, grave peril. Essentially, if we don't reduce our military and become an equal among equals. 
He also said that the nation faces a truly profound moment where it must decide whether to continue as an empire and collapse or to scale down into a lesser power. And he really hi highlighted that amidst this state of absolute chaos, the country is in dire need of a long-term focused anti-war movement like the Divest from the War Machine campaign. We also heard from titans of fellow divestment movements. So we learned from Lisa Renstrom, she's from Divest Invest, and they've been a large supporter of the fossil fuel divestment movement. And she taught us that the biggest hurdle for divestment campaigns is that most people don't think of themselves as investors. But if you have a 401k, you're an investor. If you go to a university, you are an investor. If you live in a city, you're an investor. Uh, so people really have to relate to this idea of divestment and understand that it's an accessible tool for anyone and that anyone has power here. Everyone has power here. And we have to really get past this hurdle of people only seeing others as investors. So we also heard from Garrick Ruiz. He is from the Boycott, Divestment, and Sanction National Committee. So targeting corporations, profiting from them. So this is something that we need all of your help on as you build your own campaigns. So connecting with other divestment movements that are going on in your communities. There's some really beautiful, powerful divestment work happening in this country. Um, so try to build coalition with groups working in your area that are calling for divestment from private prisons, from pipeline projects, fossil fuel companies, uh, companies profiting from the occupation of Palestine, and the list goes on. So we have a really amazing opportunity to plug in and really build movements here. And last, we also heard from Susie Snyder, who is from the Don't Bank on the Bomb campaign that I mentioned earlier. And she summarized the strategy of divestment for us by saying, divestment is a long-term commitment, but you can have really powerful short-term wins and winning is fun. So we are super excited to start getting some of those wins with all of you, both short and long-term wins. Um, and in order to achieve those wins, we are rolling out a series of organizing resources to help you get your campaigns going. So what we are launching is a general campaign guide, a campaign guide for city level campaigns, one for university level organizing, and then we're also equipping you with a draft city council resolution and a mayoral pledge. So I am going to let Christy hop on and start talking about some of those guides and we'll get them pulled up so that you can see what you're working with. Great. So as Hilla mentioned, the first um, guide that we're creating is this um, general campaign guide. And so this is useful um, as a kickoff for any divestment campaign. Um, it does a good job of sort of laying out um, what a divestment campaign looks like, what the overall components of what any campaign um, should look like, and is a useful way of starting to approach um, a divestment campaign, whether it's um, a foundation, businesses, individual investment, um, and includes information on how to request um, information and, um, and an overview of investments from any kind of financial institution who you would need to talk to, how you get in touch with people in positions of power at a financial institution, as well as um, some strategies and tactics on how and when to raise the profile and publicity of your campaign if you aren't getting what you want. Um, it touches a little bit on individual divestment, um, but really offers um, also a lot of responses to common misconceptions about not only the global arms trade, but um, divestment and, um, and all of the kind of informational pieces you'll need um, when you're approaching a campaign to target we weapons companies. Um, so this is really like the kind of big picture overview campaign guide um, that would, I think, really be useful for any group. And we've written it for a fairly general um, audience. So no matter who you are, you'll probably get something out of that guide. 
Right. And the ultimate goal of all of these campaign guides is to answer the question of just sort of where do I start? Another very important thing to note about divestment is it's always a process of learning as you go. So these are a launching point for all of our campaigns. And as we all go on and these campaigns take shape, uh, let us know what gaps there still are. And we are here to fill those gaps and, as Christy said, really develop tools and resources that you may need. Uh, so next is this guide for uh, city officials and activists taking on city level campaigns. So options are to propose an ordinance which changes city law. And so that's a bit uh, more legally binding and would put legal restrictions on what a city could invest in, or you can do a city council resolution, which are more symbolic, but are also binding. And what's important to note about city level campaigning is that assets in state and local governments uh, totaled to roughly $3.7 trillion in 2016. And uh, in 2013, which is the year that the most recent data is available, cities earned $215.4 billion more than they spent. And most of those profits came from returns on investments. So while not all city funds are invested in weapons manufacturers, it is, you can assume that some are. So the portion of these funds that are invested in the arms trade would make a massively significant impact if divested from the arms industry. So uh, like I said earlier, we're also equipping you with a city council resolution um, to get these sorts of campaigns going. Great. So the next resource that we've put together is really aimed at students, teachers, alumni. So um, as Haley said, if you're a student, you're invested. Um, if you are an alum of a university, you're an investor um, because universities often rely on alumni donations. So this next guide that we've put together is um, very much inspired by the fossil fuel divestment movement. Um, there's been a really incredible amount of student activism around fossil fuel divestment um, in the last few years. And so this guide teaches activists how to examine the university endowment funds, um, how to build support on campus, how and when to ramp up the energy of the campaign, um, some good responses if you're getting a no or a negative response from university officials. Um, and then just to underscore again that um, the onus is really on these institutions, particularly universities, um, to create policies around divestment from um, weapons companies. I think that it is safe to assume that unless there is a plan um, or a policy in place that whatever institution you're working with is invested in these companies. Um, assume, <laughs> assume that unless there is a plan or a policy that, um, that your institution is invested and operate from that place. Um, so the next, um, the next resource we have is a sample pledge um, for mayors to commit to work with their city councils to divest city funds. Um, again, this is more of a symbolic um, kind of pledge, but is a useful tool nonetheless and um, could provide a good um, a good set of talking points when you're talking to power holders um, and asking them to take a first step of signing a pledge is a great place to start. Um, so these materials are really just a base for you to work off of um, as we um, as we move forward in the campaign, um, we're gonna be creating even more resources. Um, so again, letting us know what would be helpful. Um, and we are always excited to coach um, people in creating and carrying out these campaigns. Um, we're really here as a resource for you all because as I mentioned, Code Pink is super grassroots. We're really dependent on local organizing 
And so we're really here to support you because that's what this campaign is all about. Um, so don't be a stranger. <laughs> um, Haley, was there anything else you wanted to add on the resource piece before I move into points of intervention? No, nope, I don't think so. Just let us know what you need from us. I'm excited to hear your responses as you dive into all of them. And yeah, that sums it up. Great. Um, and maybe you can pull up the, the slides again. Yep, there we go. Amazing. Okay. Um, so to give credit where credit is due, um, this framework um, is um, was created by a friend of mine named Patrick Rainsborough. He's the creator and founder of an organization now called the Center for Story-Based Strategy. Um, and all of these materials are available online at their website. It's all open source. So I just wanna say like big ups to Patrick and Center for Story-Based Strategy for creating all of these awesome materials. So, um, and as I was saying to Haley when we were on the phone earlier, this training could be theoretically like a couple of hours long. Um, so I'm giving you the really like quick and dirty version of this. And um, again, if you want to dive deeper, there are places online where you can like really nerd out on this stuff. But one of the first and perhaps most important steps in a campaign is deciding on the target. Um, points of intervention, um, which is the name that Patrick gave to this framework, um, it are specific places, both literal and metaphorical, in a system of power um, where a targeted action can really interrupt the functioning of that system and interrupt um, the flow of business as usual. Um, and so by understanding these different points, um, and by, I think, within the divestment campaign, really utilizing um, opportunities for action at each of these different points, um, we have the ability to develop and implement a strategy that, um, that identifies and puts pressure on the best places to intervene in order to have a huge impact. Um, so that's kind of the beauty, again, of divestment as a strategy is that we can take action on all of these different points of intervention um, in order to amplify our collective impact. So um, social movements have traditionally intervened by taking direct action at physical points in the systems that shape our lives. Um, with the spread of effective labor organizing and increasing power of media, um, conceptual points of intervention have also become increasingly important. So we'll talk about both literal targets and kind of metaphorical targets. Um, but truly effective intervention goes beyond simply disrupting a system um, to pose a deeper challenge um, by challenging these underlying assumptions and basic legitimacy, which again is really what we're getting at with this, this divestment campaign is challenging the legitimacy of these corporations that are making a killing from killing. Um, and so this holds true whether the intervention targets a physical system like a sweatshop or a weapons manufacturing facility or targets an ideological system like warmongering and like police brutality or the war on terror. Can you see my quotation marks in my screen? Um, so um, as we move into next slide, my dear. <laughs> um, so the five types of points of intervention are points of production. So for instance, um, like I said, a weapons factory, points of destruction, like our streets, police departments, military facilities, um, points of consumption. Um, so within divestment, that might be a retail banking location, um, points of decision, 
Um, this might be city hall, a university administration, the decision makers within your religious institution, um, whoever's making the decisions about where this money is going to flow. Um, and then finally, points of assumption. So this might be um, around a foundational narrative. Um, as Haley mentioned, these companies love to position themselves as high-tech companies or as job creators, um, so challenging that narrative. Um, or a place of symbolic importance um, within the media, within public space. Um, these companies rely on these underlying narratives staying unchallenged. And so whether you have a weapons factory in your town or not, you have the ability to challenge these companies everywhere, basically, because the war machine is so infiltrated into every dimension of our lives, whether it's our schools, our churches, our cities, our retirement funds, um, our media, our public space. Um, and so we have the ability to challenge them everywhere because they are everywhere. Um, so action at the point of production. This is probably what we all think of um, when we think of labor organizing, but um, challenging um, the point of production um, is when workers or citizens organize to target the economic system where it directly affects them um, and where that system is perhaps most vulnerable. So strikes, picket lines, work slowdowns, factory takeovers, even demonstrations at these facilities, um, these are all examples of action at a point of production. Um, Point of destruction. Um, a point of destruction action, I think these are made popular um, by My Movement Home, which is the environmental justice, uh, climate justice movements. Um, point of destruction is where the is the place at which the harm or the injustice is actually occurring. Um, so this is, could be a place where the resources are being extracted, like a strip mine or where waste from a point of production is being dumped like a landfill. Um, but by design, the point of destruction is almost always far away from public attention. So for instance, we probably won't be doing a whole lot of point of destruction actions within this campaign because these wars are all happening really far from home. Um, the exception being the wars in our streets um, and the places where these weapons are making their ways into our daily lives and communities, um, which is why I mentioned police stations, um, police departments in our streets um, around weaponized police and police brutality. Um, so these, um, these points of destruction also tend to disproportionately impact already marginalized communities and intervention at these points of destruction um, might halt an act of destruction within the moment, but often calls attention on a larger level to that destruction. Um, so point of consumption, um, this would be, um, made popular by shopping mall actions, um, Black Friday actions, which we've seen um, within the movement for Black Lives within the last few years. Um, but point of consumption actions are in the traditional arena of consumer boycotts, storefront de demonstrations, um, where we're linking a location um, of interaction with a product or service that's linked to injustice. So again, this is why I mentioned retail banking locations, your local Bank of America branch, um, the offices of socially responsible investment companies. Um, these are often the most visible point of intervention for targeting um, commercial entities. Um, and they're also a really good way of getting the attention of corporations, getting the attention of everyday consumers, when, particularly when government officials aren't listening. Um, so we're going to the companies directly, and we're going to the place where they exist in the public realm most directly. So the point of decision is where um, 
the power to act on a campaign's demands rests on power holders or decision makers. Um, this is often one of the most self-evident points of intervention um, and often one of the most targeted. So whether it's the office of a slumlord or the office of your university provost, um, there are the places where decision makers um, work and are doing their decision making um, are probably going to be the most obvious points of intervention on this campaign. Um, this also, um, one of the most famous um, mobilizations of all time, the 1999 um, WTO meetings in Seattle is a great example of a point of decision action where activists were targeting a summit meeting for a huge range of injustices. Um, and, and this is one of the most direct ways to put pressure on key decision makers. So finally, um, the point of assumption. Um, assumptions are really the building blocks of political belief systems and of the, the culture that surrounds um, these issues, particularly around militarization, particularly around um, companies that are making a killing from killing. Again, we're challenging their legitimacy. We're challenging the implicit permission we've given them to exist in the political and public realm kind of on a free pass um, because this is our daily lives and we've kind of given these companies a hall pass to operate and to push whatever narratives they want without being challenged. So when we challenge basic assumptions, we can expose these companies as being contrary to people's lived experience, core values, and we can shift entire belief systems. Because again, as Haley mentioned, you know, we can't count right now on a president and a Congress that's willing to act on our behalf. We're really taking this power back and reclaiming it and acting on our own behalf. Um, so point of assumption actions can be really effective at shifting the discourse around an issue um, and opening up new political space and new discussion around potential um, and reframing, reframing an issue, amplifying the voices of previously silenced characters within the story that we're telling, um, as well as offering up an alternate vision for what we see. Um, so that's where the alternate vision of um, investment in life-affirming policies and program, programs comes into play, where we can really articulate what our vision is for not just divestment, but reinvestment in healthcare, education, infrastructure that is life affirming um, and that can be enjoyed by all citizens. So uh, flipping the slide there, <laughs> uh, turning creative action into real change um, is, is really what this is all about. And um, it requires careful strategizing. Um, as I hope we've talked a lot about so far on this webinar because I really believe in it. Um, nobody can do everything, but everyone can do something. Um, so when it comes to divestment from the war machine, there are these points of intervention everywhere um, because the war machine permeates so much of our daily lives. And so when we identify these different possible points to target, we're taking a really important first step in designing actions that connect to this larger campaign and, and going a long way towards meeting some of these goals um, around social change. Um, so um, I've just talked a lot and I wanna make sure that we have time for questions. Um, I see one question around um, wanting to know our emails, contact information, and the URL for where we're going to see the webinar. Haley, is that something that you can just send out to all the participants after we wrap yeah. up? 
Absolutely. Awesome. We'll be sending a follow-up email uh, with a link to the recorded webinar. We'll put it up on that resources page because as we continue to do this series of webinar trainings, we are going to have them all accessible on the resources page. And then, um, like you saw earlier, we have the new Divest from War Machine website up and running. And so there's a new email attached to that. So I'll send all of this in an email after the webinar. Um, and there was also a question about where folks can access the resource guides. And so that'll be in the same email um, so that you'll be able to download all of these resources to your heart's content. Um, there's exactly. a lot of- And just to plug the new website once more, it is divestfromwarmachine.org. So divestfromwarmachine.org. So this campaign, while Code Pink is happy to anchor it and provide resources for the campaign, this is really a standalone campaign that we want everyone to feel like they have ownership of. Uh, so really, it's, it's yours. It's yours to take. Um, and I'm going to put that URL in the chat right now. Um, Great. Divestfromwarmachine.org. Um, oh, the new website's so pretty. It makes me so happy. <laughs> um, any, um, oh, we have somebody who, um, wants copies of the slides. Yeah, we can put those up as a PDF probably on the resources page. Um, and then material for the last assumption point. Let's see. I'm not sure what that means. She's offering. She has. Oh, okay, great. Um, great. The last assumption point. Um, um, yeah, do you want to pop that in the chat? I would love to hear it. If you have more material. Um, here in Costa Rica, our assumptions are excellent. I have a film on how we arrived there. Um, great. If you have a link um, to that material, feel free to pop it into the chat. That would be great. Um, so, um, If there are no more questions, um, I wanted to take one last uh, opportunity to plug this day of action. Again, we're going to have a webinar in January where we're going to talk all about um, how to create and um, and make um, uh, these creative actions. Um, and then uh, also, talk, I just wanted to kind of plug again this week of action at the end of January, where we're going to be doing actions all around the country and internationally, probably, um, around divestment from the war machine. Um, and really hoping that you all can be a part of that. Um, oh, great. Somebody put in the um, the resource around this um, point of assumption piece. Um, and I'm seeing one more question, which I will definitely answer before we hop off. So um, what can we do next steps? So there's a place on divestfromwarmachine.org for you to pledge to divest from your own, your own assets for more. Um, Choosing a target, we have, um, again, big thanks to um, Center for Story-Based Strategy for creating all of these amazing resources. Um, we have a worksheet that you can take back to your group um, so that your group can start looking at choosing a target that makes sense for you all. Um, we're going to be sending out a survey as well. Um, there will be a um, report back on target selection and some group organizing in the new year. 
um, this January webinar, joining us for a week of action in January. And then um, there's also, and Haley, maybe you can pop this, um, the link to sign up for the Shadow World bit um, into the chat, but we definitely encourage folks to host um, a viewing of this really incredible documentary called Shadow World um, in your local community. Um, so, um, I saw a couple more questions before we hop off. And so I wanted to answer those really quickly. I just wanted to thank folks for being here and um, for all of your patience. I know that um, these webinars are a lot to ask in terms of technology. So I really appreciate your patience and kind of sticking with us. Um, so just to answer a couple of last questions, does Code Pink have legal resources for legal issues incurred? Um, Hawaii is a military state and arrest is highly probable. Um, I don't know that Code Pink does have legal resources, but um, sometimes there's, there's, there's an organization um, and I, I plug this because um, my husband helped found it, um, but there's an organization called Midnight Special Law Collective that no longer exists, but they have all of their Know Your Rights and legal resources available open source online. So I'm gonna put the, um, the link to that in the chat. It's midnightspecial.net and you can find tons of legal resources on that website. Um, in case anything happens, because sometimes things happen. Um, does Code Pink have a faith-based coordinator, someone to help me connect with churches in the SoCal area? We don't, but we will. <laughs> We're working on it. Um, and in the meantime, um, there are definitely folks for you to connect with in Southern California. So zip us an email and we'll get you connected. Um, and then is there a way, this is a similar question, is there a way to know if there are others located within our local community who we can organize with? Um, let, send us an email and let us know where you are and we'll do our best to connect you with people who are doing awesome things in your area. Um, and if we can't connect you with awesome people in your area, we will teach you how to create a group so that you can find the awesome people in your area um, who want to do these things. Um, anything else before we hop? We will send out all of this information. I know we mentioned a ton of resources in this training, um, so we'll make sure that you have access to all of it, and um, we can't wait to mix it up with you in the new year. It's going to be a lot of fun. Ooh, one more question. Um, Do we? Uh, what does it mean that Code Pink organizationally will be, will be targeting Lockheed Martin? How does that affect what we do locally? It just means that Code Pink is taking that on as our organizational target. So we'll be connecting the Lockheed Martin work um, around divestment with previously existing Code Pink work that's kind of already happening. It affects what you do locally, not at all. Um, because like I said, it's gonna really take all of us. Um, and so there are other groups within this Divest From War Machine um, coalition who are taking on other companies within the big five. Um, and it just so happens that Code Pink is taking on Lockheed Martin, but you shouldn't let that affect what you do locally. You should choose locally the target that works best for you and your group. Um, because it is going to take all of us. Um, this is a really big, ambitious campaign, um, and there are a lot of resources um, that, um, that we need to divest. So you could take on Lockheed, and that would be awesome. You could take on a completely different target, and that would be equally awesome. Um, so don't feel, um, don't feel pressured just because Code Pink is taking on Lockheed uh, to let that guide you. Choose the target that makes the most sense for your group strategically. 
for sure. And the Code Pink campaign targeting Lockheed Martin is going to be very direct action heavy, which we hope your campaigns are also, but uh, divestment is often sometimes a slower process of getting in touch with fund managers or your city council representatives. And uh, like Code Pink, for instance, is going to target, there's a youth uh, sort of science festival in Washington, D.C. in April. And Lockheed Martin is one of the primary funders. They are uh, one of the founders of the, this child science fe uh, festival. So we're going to try to expose connections like that where uh, it, do it doesn't so much fit into the strategy of divestment. It's a little bit different, but um, yeah, we're super excited to connect it with and, and support other campaigns with that work. Um. And, um, and like I mentioned, we are bringing on more organizers to help with coordinating students and faith communities and city campaigns and all of that. So regardless of what target you choose, you're going to be getting tons of support um, from us and from other Code Pinkers. So um, again, thank you all so much for being here. This is really awesome. All right. Thank you, everyone. Fantastic to connect. We're still in the early phases and we can't wait to build this with you. Yay. See you awesome. all in January. <laughs> all right. Let's get to work. All Thanks, right. everyone. Thanks. Bye.